Let me just read a couple verses to get you thinking in this direction, and we'll just jump into some of these slides and go through a couple verses as we go. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, I love this passage, verse 11, for other foundation can no man lay than that is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, if any man build upon this foundation, that's what we are doing as Christians. We're building on this foundation, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're not working our way to heaven. But good works are flowing out of our lives because of everything the Lord Jesus has done for us. That's how it should be. If any man built on this foundation, gold, silver, precious stones... Wood, hay, stubble, every man's work shall be made manifest, for the day shall declare it, because it shall be revealed by fire. Notice those three words, manifest, declare it, revealed. Everything that your life consists of is going to come out to light someday. Everything that went through your hands, your time, your talents, your money, all of it's going to come to light. Not just what you show in church, everything's going to come to light someday. It's all going to be revealed by fire. And the fire shall try every man's work of what sort it is. If any man's work abide, which he hath built thereupon, he shall receive a reward. I want that for me and I want that for you. If any man's work shall be burned, he shall suffer loss. I don't want that for us. But he himself shall be saved, yet so as by fire. We'll jump into uh, some of these slides. I just want to show you some of the things, again, that God is doing in Haiti. God is doing. It's not us doing it. God is doing it. And we're just along for the ride, and, and I love serving him. I love what the old song says, The longer I serve him, the sweeter he grows. That's so true. This is our family, and uh, you notice two more. Uh, I'll show you another picture. Uh, we're adopting twins, so we'll talk about that in a minute. But uh, I thought we were done, and we were empty <laughs> nesters. The Lord had other plans. Uh, I think I'm going to click through these if this works. There we go. One of the key goals in missions is this verse, 2 Timothy 2.2. And I, I, would, I would debate with a missionary, if we're not doing at least this in some part, what are we doing long term? And if you talk to my dad, he would tell you of all the things they did on the mission field, this was the most effective thing looking back on the mission field. And they were involved in, in all kinds of things, Christian camps. You name it, they had it going on. They were serving the Lord faithfully. But this verse in 2 Timothy 2.2 is a key. The things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to what kind of people? Faithful. Faithful men. Not talented, not good looking. Faithful. Why? Because they keep going. And if you've been in ministry long enough, you know there are some times you picked people for certain positions. It wasn't because of faithfulness. It could have been talent. It could have been personality. It could have been something else, and you were pretty disappointed. There's a reason. We pick faithful people. Why? Because they stay with it when times get tough. They stay with it when there's problems. They stay with it when there's frustrations and disappointment. And, and for the most part, the American church is pretty fickle nowadays. Somebody hurt my feelings. I'm leaving. Really? You're leaving your church? You're leaving this body of Christ, this fellowship of believers, because someone hurt your feelings? No, you're not. Stay faithful. Faithful. Train faithful men. By the way, that's why we have the gospel today. Because faithful people kept passing it to faithful people, and there are faithful pre people preaching the word today. And you have faithful leaders right here in this church that received it from faithful people. You train faithful men who will be able to teach others also. So this is part of our uh, ministry. I'm getting too excited here, I guess. 
We're training national pastors and church planters. Uh, we try to get as many of these guys into Bible college as we can. Some are in a Bible college there in Jacmel. We have some now uh, this year for the first time. I'm excited about this. Uh, about a half a dozen guys in Haiti that are working on a master's degree. And then we have Haitian pastors that, that are in the Dominican Republic. Some of our ministry is over there with Haitian nationals. Uh, when the doors close completely and the borders close, we go to the DR and just keep working. Uh, we have some guys over there working through Louisiana Baptist University online, uh, working on their master's degree and undergraduate degree uh, in Spanish, and they're translating that into French uh, so that our guys in Haiti eventually will be able to use some of that. So training of national pastors, it's not always uh, easy, and it's not always an ideal situation in Haiti. One pastor that we started working with had a second grade education. It's hard to send a guy to Bible college with a second grade education. So uh, we started paying a tutor to take him through <laughs> classes. I think he's done with sixth grade now. <laughs> he's a married man with children. Uh, but he did find a Bible institute in Jacques Mel that would take guys in uh, without their high school diploma. So we just praise the Lord. It's not a short-term fix. Some of these things take, take many years to see fruit and result, but faithfulness will allow you to see some of that. Not just the pastors, but even lay leaders. Many of these people cannot read or write. They've never had the privilege to go to school, uh, but they have a heart to serve the Lord. They want to get involved. They want to train others. So we take times to bring them in. We have a training center up in, in the mountains in a place called Sagan. And you see a group of them there, simple people, just coming and learning more about God's word and learning how to train and teach others. That's a key to ministry. An important key to ministry is training faithful people. The churches are pretty poor down there. When I say pretty poor, most of the families have buried at least one child. Out of simple things, malnutrition, simple disease that went untreated, that could have been treated with just simple medications we take for granted. Most of them have buried at least one, some of them multiple kids, and that is just typical common life in the mountains of Haiti. They're used to death. They see it all the time. And so in the churches, it's, it's hard for them to even start and have a little simple building uh, where they can worship the Lord. So this is typically how they'll start. They'll cut down some little trees, some little saplings. Uh, if they have some tarps, the tarps become the, the roof and the walls. If they don't have any tarp, cut down some coconut branches, and that becomes the roof to block out the sun. And when it's raining, uh, church is not happening, okay? A little rain in Haiti is kind of like a foot of snow here in Pensacola, I guess. Uh, it's, it's just not, it's not going to happen. They, they don't get out that much. They, they're all walking to church, hiking muddy trails. And so one thing we try to do is help build a simple building, uh, just a simple block building. The last picture you saw, that tarp, this was a few months later, same location. Uh, we built a simple block building. And the, the way we do that is just churches and individuals here in the states get involved. And they say, hey, we want to help, help a new church uh, have a home where they can worship the Lord for the next 50 to 100 years if the Lord tarries. And so that costs about $30,000. We make them get involved in the process. Now, I realize they're poor, but they have to have ownership. I believe strongly in that. So we tell them, pick two materials, because usually, like this place, they had a lot of uh, sand close by, sand pits, so they could get the sand out for mortar and bring it to the church. So the church members did that. Uh, the youth group activities, <laughs> you go dig sand, put that five-gallon bucket of sand on your head and carry it. Uh, to the construction site. So that gives them ownership without laying a big burden uh, at their feet financially. And so the churches take ownership in it. By God's grace and to his glory, we've built 17 of these in Haiti and five in the Dominican Republic. 
And uh, if God gives us time and life and provision, I'd like to do this a hundred times. Uh, if, if God wills, we'll just keep heading in that direction. I want you to stop and think about this verse for a second. I graduated from Pensacola. I went on to seminary, uh, worked, even worked on some classes for a, a doctor of ministry degree. I know my philosophy of ministry. I know I'm focused on church planting and training national pastors. And I know that that is the priority, and I want to keep that as the priority. But when you serve in one of the poorest countries on earth, there are a lot of needs that keep coming up. And keep coming back to you. Haiti's the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. And we, a lot of times, get a front row seat to extreme poverty. We see things we don't necessarily want to see, but that's just how it is. This verse is very convicting to the American Christian, it ought to be. Look at this verse. But whoso hath this world's good. Look at somebody next to you and say, that's me. You guys are awfully quiet. <laughs> Let's try that again. Look at somebody next to you and say, that's me. Look at somebody next to you and say, that's us. Do you believe that? If you don't, I might have to argue with you. Because I see poverty but I also see wealth. That is us, American Christians. We have this world's good. Whoso hath this world's good and seeth. That's, that's really my goal this morning. I just want you to see a piece of what I see. Now, what you decide to do with that, that's your business. You just have to explain what you did and didn't do at the judgment seat of Christ. I want you to see some of this world's needs. And, and I'm, I'm not even showing you all of what's going on. I'm just showing you bits and pieces because God's doing amazing things on so many scales in Haiti right now. Whoso seeth his brother have need and shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him. How dwelleth the love of God in him? That's a strong verse. It's kind of disgusting as you think about it. When your bowels are not functioning anymore, you're constipated. And I'm not trying to be disgusting. But this is one of the problems with American Christianity. God has blessed us so much with things that we are, for the most part, not every church and not every family, but we have a problem. We are constipated with materialism because our bowels of compassion have become bowels of consumption. God's blessed us so much, there ought to be a lot flowing out. To whom much is given, much is required. And in so many cases, we're heaping it on to our own lust and our own desires. Don't tell me you're not affected. I'm affected. We're affected with this. We have this problem. I want you to see just bits and pieces. This is just Haiti. But listen, the need is throughout the world. And we can do so much about it. I'm telling you, we can do more. I, I heard an old missionary, he's about 80 years old. He got up at a missions conference recently and he was preaching, and the first thing he said, whatever you're doing for the Lord right now, you could be doing more. 
I thought, man, I'm pretty busy. <laughs> I got a lot going on. But he's right. And if he can say that at 80 years old, I should be able to say that and do that in my 40s. Whatever I'm doing for God, I, I have more energy than this. I have more time than this. I can do more with what God has entrusted to me. Because to whom much is given, much is required. And, and if that's us, if we shut up our bowels of compassion, here's the question. How dwelleth the love of God in him? How can I say that God's love is dwelling inside of me if that's how I'm living? That's a convicting question. As, as we look at some more of these slides, I... I want you to just uh, pray for our ministry. I want you to see opportunities to get involved. But at the end of the day, I want you to be able to give a good answer when you and your family stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Because we can, we can walk out of church this morning and you can give me excuses as to why you can't go, as to why you can't give. They might sound good to me. They probably won't, but they might. But my concern is a lot of those excuses, if we think about it, will not make any sense at the judgment seat of Christ based on what Christ did for us. And that's what matters. Our response to medical needs, uh, we've, we've tried to do a medical, mobile medical missions trip uh, every year for the last 10 plus years. Mariah led uh, her first one this last summer in the Dominican. Uh, we worked in the Dominican recently, but this last summer in Haiti, she led her first medical trip. So there are opportunities, nurses, doctors, to get involved in something like that, uh, to be part of that. We see so many medical problems now over the years that we're trying to build a, a medical facility. You see a picture of it here. Uh, it's, it's taken a lot of funds, a lot of money. Uh, we are, it's a slow process because the dump trucks that haul sand up there and gravel for the construction, it takes them uh, pretty much two or three hours one way to get up there and back. Uh, with one load. A lot of the drivers don't want to go because the ro road is so rough. Uh, so you're lucky to get a few loads every week. And so we are patiently waiting for that. It's also the rainy season right now. So when it rains, they can't get up those muddy hills. And uh, by the grace of God, we will pour the concrete roof on this later on this month. And we will start offering some services up there. We'll have a labor and delivery room to get moms out of their uh, dirt floor house and in a sanitary environment to give birth. Uh, we'll have a little pharmacy up there and an x-ray room and ultrasound, uh, all kinds of cool things. The only thing like it anywhere in that area of southeastern Haiti. This is just a view of the same building from up above. Uh, we got the walls built now and the tie beams are poured and so we're just waiting on all that uh, material to get up there. So pray for that construction project uh, up in Sagan. No, you don't get to see the twins yet. Close your eyes. We'll go back. All right. Uh, in our mountain churches, I mentioned this, I think there's, uh, we see over and over death of little ones uh, just about every year when we do a medical trip, uh, we have parents that bring a little one, a little baby or toddler to us uh, where life is just gone out of them. Uh, they're still alive, but barely. And in many of those cases, uh, during that week, sometimes the next day, uh, they, they have gone uh, to heaven. Uh, those are tough. Those are tough things. Uh, to watch and to see over and over and over again. There are times that, that we ask the parents if we can take them. And, uh, and so one of the group members takes them, one of the Haitian staff members, and uh, they'll take them in for a few months or sometimes a few years to care for them, bring them back to life. And so we've seen some good success there with, with several kids, and we praise the Lord for that. Uh, but even this last summer... Uh, this grandma here on the right was taking care of her grandbaby. When one of the Haitian doctors saw him, 
He said, we need to get him to a hospital right away. Uh, you see that whiteness around his face? He said, that's an extreme case of malnutrition. Uh, we need to get, get him down to the hospital. He's swollen. And the mom uh, couldn't take care of him. She just, she had some uh, mental instability issues. And so the grandma was caring for uh, her little grandbaby there. But he passed away that week uh, as well. Uh, one, of the, one of our responses to this is we're building a children's home. We praise the Lord for his provision to get this going. Uh, we are uh, just walking forward by faith to, to keep building. Uh, we should be able to open this up uh, later on this year and start taking in kids. Some of them will take in long term. They'll have to stay there, uh, especially if they're true orphans and don't have a home to return to. Some of them will be able to take in just for a few months or a year or so and get them back to life and then get them back to their parents. Uh, you know, these, I know these don't fall into the philosophy of church planting if you're teaching that in a college setting. But when you have this world's goods, you have a responsibility to do something about the needs of our brothers and sisters in Christ. You can't avoid that. You find it throughout Scripture. And I know there are arguments, well, we've poured so much money into Haiti. Well, <laughs> yeah, some of it has gotten there. Some of it did not get there. Uh, don't get me started about the Clinton Foundation and the Red Cross and, and some of these other things. At the end of the day, listen, it's not the UN's responsibility. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 9. When churches are hurting, other churches take that responsibility and do something about it. And when they do, you get to the end of that passage, when they do, the receivers, the recipients praise the Lord. They glorify God for the givers surrender to the gospel. Go study that this afternoon. And they pray for you. So many times I've, I've stood by a Haitian pastor who's praying for churches back here in the States saying, God, we don't know where this money came from to do this, but we're praying for those who gave and sacrificed for these things to happen. And we could never repay them in this life. But we pray for them. We pray for blessings for their family. We pray for blessings on their church. They glorify God for the reality of our faith in the states that's proven by our sacrifice and our love. And God is glorified in all of it. I get a front row seat to that, and I love watching it. I love watching it. I don't like seeing some of the, the tough situations, but it's just the reality of how so many people are living in this world right now. You want to see the twins, don't you? This was not my plan. <laughs> I had a good plan. We got married right out of college. I think eight days later, we graduated December 12th uh, in 97. Got married on December 20th in Iowa. Not the greatest planning on my part. Um, it's freezing cold up there. And we had our kids young. And we're supposed to be empty nesters now, okay? So it's going to be great. We're just going to coast on out through life, hit the cruise control button, and let those kids get out of the house, go to college, just come back once in a while, but don't stay, you know? <laughs> go have some grandkids for us, but they don't, they're not going to stay either, you know? Just, it's going to be great. And... I had gotten a picture from one of our pastors. This is one of the blessings of working with Haitian pastors. They'll send me random, gross pictures with no explanation. <laughs> They'll send me stuff from a surgery, and I'll be looking at a big clump of something that a doctor just removed, and I have no idea what I'm looking at. No explanation. 
uh, and then they'll give that to me later. He sent me a picture of a little girl whose forehead had, had just been eaten off completely by a rat. A rat had gotten in, into the home. Uh, first month of, month of life attacked her every week, but the fourth week uh, just really had eaten everything, pierced holes all around her nose and everything. And uh, they said that she was just, there was so much blood that she was actually uh, breathing through, through some of the, the holes around her nose that the, the rat had pierced. So he was actually apologizing to me because he knows I'm pretty strict with the funds that come down. They have to be spent for uh, what we talked about, and there aren't any changes uh, with that. Otherwise, I, I get upset because <laughs> I want you to know when you give to something and we said we're going to do something that I give that same report uh, back here. And so uh, we we're try to be real strict with that. So he was apologizing. He said, Pastor Kevin, I'm sorry, but I borrowed, I took money out of the, uh, the building funds that we would, were going to buy sand with. And we took uh, this little girl to the hospital uh, to try to get her get her fixed up some because uh, the dad the pastor went over to pray with the couple and and uh, he said what are, what are we going to do the pastor did and the dad said well I guess she's just going to die because I don't have any I don't have any money to take her anywhere to the hospital or anything that's just the reality that they live and the pastor said well no I have some money here let's uh, let's take her down. So they got her uh, down to the hospital, got her patched up. And, and when we were up there, uh, about a month later, they were two months old. The mom was really sick, deathly ill uh, on her deathbed. By the grace of God, she lived through it, and she's doing better now. But uh, they explained the situation. Uh, these two, the mom wasn't able to, to feed them, so they were crushing up saltine crackers, mixing that with water. Uh, to feed them just to put something in their, their bellies uh, for the t first two months of life. They were just hanging on by a thread. They were, I don't think, even four and five pounds yet at two months old, uh, just barely hanging on, probably within a few days or a week uh, of same fate. And I was, I was working, I was at the construction site you saw there in the middle, and you know how a conversation is coming and you don't want to be in that conversation? And you already know kind of how the conversation is going to go? I, I did not hear an audible voice, but the Holy Spirit started talking. <laughs> and I knew where this conversation was going because... I knew, I know from Haitian culture, it is like it was here in the States 100, 150 years ago, to where if you stepped in, if your brother or someone else in the family had six or eight kids and you had none and, and they couldn't care for them, you stepped in, you took some to help on the farm or whatever, and you cared for them and raised them as your own, and, and they tried to, to raise the others. It's still happening in Haiti today all the time. And I knew if we stepped into this situation and took these two, by the way, it's twins, the little girl has a brother. I knew if we stepped in to take them, it wasn't going to be a month or two because the parents, even though they love them, they would not want to receive them back. They've already buried one. They have several others they can barely keep alive. And I knew if we stepped in, they were going to say, <laughs> they're yours. And I was trying to explain to the Holy Spirit. <laughs> my plan. I was trying to preempt this conversation that I, <laughs> I saw coming very quickly. And I was like, no, 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 no. No, I'm very busy working for you. <laughs> And the Holy Spirit has a way of convicting our hearts. He has a way of questioning. And one of the questions was, are you done living? 
think that's a good question. It's a reasonable question. Am I too old to do what you're asking of me? And I had to come to the conclusion, I don't know if I'm done living. My days are in your hands. I don't control the rest of my life. So if you're asking me to do something, obviously you have some plans still for my life. And it's not time for me to quit. The next question was very tough. Are you done loving? See, what he gives needs to be flowing back out. You've raised four kids for my glory. They're serving me. They love me. Can you not love two more for my glory? And trying to explain to the Holy Spirit how good my plan is. But at the end of it, here's, here's what gets me. If I say no, how do I explain that at the judgment seat of Christ? These two died, even though you were calling me to personally get involved with this family. Now, I see these cases all the time. The Holy Spirit doesn't lead me to get involved in every case. But when the Holy Spirit leads you to get involved in something, how do you explain your no at the judgment seat? You want to frustrate God, start making your excuses like Moses. But you really want to make God mad. You tell him like Moses, Pick someone else. Don't pick me for this job. Pick someone else. Listen, if God calls you to do something and he picks you to do something, to go somewhere, to give something, he's got a reason for that for you. You don't have to explain how others respond to the gospel you don't have to explain how others didn't respond when they saw need. You have to be obedient to the Holy Spirit when he talks to you. That's it. I can't control your reactions. I can't control your actions. But I can tell you this. When you step in by faith and obey God, and do what he tells you to do. There is so much joy in losing your life for the cause of Christ. That's when you find it, isn't it? Isn't that what the Bible tells us? Amen. But he who would keep his life, I'm going to hold on to my life. I'm going to do my things. I'm going to do it my way. I've heard so many songs about that over the years. I did it my way. You do it your way, Christian. And you find out there's no joy in that. The things you think are going to bring joy, they don't. They bring frustration. They bring anger. They bring division. They bring death. But you give your life over to Christ completely. You surrender everything. And when he calls you, yes, I'll do it. I'll do it. Forget my excuses. I'll do it. There is such a joy that comes with that. We're, we're working through an adoption process that is super complicated because we already know the kids. They've already been in our home. Adoption agencies don't like that. The adoption agencies in Haiti and Port-au-Prince are closed right now because of all this. But I'm telling you something. By faith, God's going to accomplish this. Not because my faith is great, but because God's faithful. And he who calls you to do something will do it. He'll accomplish it. If you would like to follow along uh, with some of our uh, ministry stuff, we, we try to keep our churches updated every, every month, but 
uh, there are pictures and uh, video that we add to, to Paracleo International, our Facebook page, that, that you can see a lot more on there. As we close out, can I say this? It's really, it all comes down to a faith issue. It all come, comes back to trust and faith. If you believe God, you obey Him. And if you obey Him, you receive the blessing that comes with it. We like to get right to the blessing. But it doesn't happen that way. You know why Moses didn't go into the promised land? The Bible says, you didn't believe me to speak to the rock. Unbelief brings about disobedience, which comes with a curse. We had one morning when we visited uh, one of our churches up in the mountains. A mom brought her little toddler to us and very sick. She showed us an infection. She, she pried his little knees open and just showed us infection and said he hadn't been able to use the bathroom for some 14 days. He was in, his little body was just shaking. He was in septic shock. Went to heaven the next day. I'm telling you, we see some tough things, some, some things we don't want to see. But listen to me. Some of you have to look in the mirror and see that there's death coming in your family. There's septic shock setting in because what's supposed to be the bowels of compassion have become the bowels of consumption and comfort with the American dream. And God's given you a lot, but there's very little going out. Would you be sensitive to let the Holy Spirit change some things in your family and in your life today?